Its name spells luxury, glamour and style. Its clothes are worn by the world's most beautiful women. Thank you. Dior is a billion dollar brand, spanning beauty, perfume, handbags and dresses worth tens of thousands. Its embroidery is insane. Over 70 years, Dior's designers have been some of the biggest in the business. As they now search for a new creative director, we have privileged access to the people who decide and the super rich who buy their clothes. Join us inside this exclusive world as we discover the fabulous frocks, scandals, and ruthless business decisions which have kept Dior in the headlines. The courting of celebrities, the importance of underwear, and the psyches of the rich. Even very rich, she has problems in life. La Col Noire, Christian Dior's luxurious refuge in the south of France, away from the frenetic world of Paris fashion. Not the home you'd imagine of someone who started a fashion revolution. 1947, Paris is still struggling with post-war austerity. After years in which fabrics were rationed, Dior uses luxurious swathes of material to create a new look which changes the way women dress and shocks them the world over. Here, for example, are some new evening gowns for the summer season of 1948. They are designed by Christian Dior, the originator of the new look, though he disclaims the credit for inventing the name. These new dresses, he says, have the very latest line. Small waists, full hips, irregular hemlines, and the fullness of the skirts unevenly spread. Suddenly, you get these dresses that were not only nipped in at the waist, but also full, these full skirts looking like dance skirts. It was a reminder of a previous era and also a shock to people who had learned how to be very careful with their money. The new line is called Envol, or Fly Away. All very charming, but I should think it would fly away with your money and your coupons. Just look at the amount of material in this one. Dior model who was being photographed on the streets of Paris in the new look was actually attacked by some angry women passing by who tore the new look apart because they were so shocked. Christian Dior was an astute businessman who launched perfume, makeup and stockings alongside clothes. Its cosmetics, perfume and accessories which underpin the brand's commercial success. And at Dior's opulent country mansion, today's bosses are aiming to woo their fashionable guests. This is how Dior does things. This is uh, Le Grand Dîner, the great dinner that, uh, that we lost uh, the 200 people that we have tonight, just facing the pool, pool that uh, uh, Christian Dior himself designed. The emperor himself died just 10 years after founding the business. But his empire has learned how to exploit its past to cement its future. He's still the one that really guides us. He's the one that created uh, everything. From the very start, he has this image of and the vision of, let's say, a, a brand, a, a total brand, that could really not only make women more beautiful, but uh, more happy as well. Promoting the brand needs celebrity. So Dior has selected high-profile brand ambassadors, paid an undisclosed annual sum. Oscar-winning Charlize Theron, the face of J'adore perfume, doesn't come cheap. And her time is not to be wasted. OK, OK. We can't afford to be late. I understand. OK, we will not be late. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good evening. Hello, I'm Michael. Very good to meet you. Thank you. Fabulous dress. Thank you. 
I can just turn it. Which, how's that? I just had a pin try to kill me in this dress. Does this look okay? You don't even see it. Okay. This was the one thing that came my way right after the Academy Awards that I didn't have to think about. Um, because, I mean, to be associated or to be asked to be part of um, a house that stood the test of time, I mean, say the word Dior and it resonates a lot of things, especially for a woman. He loved women. He just loved women. And I know I don't know him personally, but I can't believe somebody can design everything that he's designed for this house and not be absolutely in love with women. If you had the opportunity and things changed, would you like to live here? Live in this house? I'll definitely take it. <laughs> Dior's owner, Bernard Arnault, is the richest man in France. His LVMH luxury empire made a profit of 6.6 .6 billion euros in 2015. The placement at this dinner is careful. Two or three top French actresses nearby. Sidney Toledano, the chief executive of the fashion side of the business, opposite. And on his right, the star guest, fashionably late, Charlize. Although she is, of course, wearing the brand she promotes, a sniff of the real thing for the man who has everything can't go amiss. Speaking of beauty, I would like to thank Charlize Theron, who has honored her by his presence this evening. Charlize. one of the most beautiful and historic stately homes in England is visited by Princess Margaret. She is attending a fashion show held in aid of the Red Cross, which features the new winter collection of Christian Dior. Her Royal Highness chats with a famous designer who has brought 13 of his top mannequins to the show and his new H line. And this is it, H for horrid or heavenly. In 1954, Christian Dior did a very important fashion show at Blenheim Palace. It brings together that sense of French style, but also the British aristocracy and British royalty. And Princess Margaret is very important in this story because she's already a fan of Christian Dior. She ordered a number of dresses from Dior, including what became her favorite ever dress, which is her 21st birthday, long white dress. And she's photographed by Cecil Beaton in the dress and she looks like a fairy tale princess. The pressure of today's fashion calendar is inexorable. Dior have to turn out seven collections a year, and for their latest, they've decided to return to the scene of their former triumph, Blenheim Palace. A vintage train is hired for the glitzy guests. Some seem less comfortable in their temporary outfits than others. As the VIP train trundles towards Blenheim, Dior have hired a less glamorous form of transport to make sure the models, some of the most sought after in the business, get there on time. Every aspiring model wants to walk in a Dior show, but however glamorous it may seem, the reality is all very no-nonsense. The 55 models are whisked straight to the route they'll be taking. The palace passes in a haze as they go through their paces on the catwalk, before being rushed to hair and makeup. Dior's exalted makeup chief is waiting for them. I went for this color blocked, this brown, chocolate brown eyeshadow. 
just to create like a, almost like a military, a really specific catwalk look. So the girls would stand out in this very rich, historic environment. You, I don't think, is, for my innocent eye, have any makeup on now, do uh -huh. you? Well, I'm, I'm, very, I'm a very shiny <laughs> person, so they keep telling me to powder, so... And so have I, you got a little bit? Yes, but it's, it, it, keeps, it keeps shining through, so... It's hopeless. <laughs> I'm hopeless. I'm, I'm too shiny. <laughs> Marketing is all. And with social media playing an increasing part, 19-year-old American model Bella Hadid, who has 5.7 million Instagram followers, has been chosen to be a beauty ambassador for the brand. It's nice to have makeup in a show that you feel comfortable in, and I love this makeup, so I'm excited. And the hair? The hair, I mean, I love a good slick back, but the gel is just now drying, so it's a little bit crunchy, but I love the way it looks. Returning to Blenheim is a clever move by the Dior machine. With the all-important decision about their new name designer still being made, it's the venue which is the story. Today is a big moment for the two in-house designers who've been promoted to fill the gap. Lucy Mayer and Serge Ruffier. As they watch the final rehearsal, the fashion world waits to see how they will do. Dior fashion boss Sidney Toledano is the man who will make the big decision about who to hire as the new designer. In terms of designer, first of all, I observe what's going on. I see you have to know what is needed, what, uh, what are the means you're offering, and what would be the person understanding the brand in terms of history, tradition, able to lead. It's a very high level, the challenges. But they could be young, could be, it's not a question of age, but inspiring and giving the tone what will be the vision of the person for the future. While Mr. Toledano wrestles with the future direction of the company, with an all-important haute couture show to come in just five weeks' time, one young model is being given last-minute tips by casting director Anita Bitton on the fine art of changing direction on the catwalk. Another step into it, so you're not so... So you're not turning around. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Try one more time. Okay. Take the shoes off. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask, were you finding it difficult to turn around? Oh, uh, it's my first time, so. Oh, really? Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. She's never done a show before. Well, did you ever do, have you ever done a casting before? No. No. So everything is new? Yeah, everything. Where are you from, my house? Uh, Denmark. Uh-huh. And can I ask how old you are? Uh, 15. Dior are on the hunt for a new top designer, but the shows must go on, and for this one, they've hired Blenheim Palace, with a 60-piece brass fanfare to herald the guests and a battalion of butlers. Christian Dior himself knew a thing or two about marketing. When he took a collection from Paris to show at Blenheim Palace in front of British royalty, it made quite an impact. Next, a creation called Peru, a yellow satin coat lined with fur over a jewel dress that took 600 hours to embroider. Do you mind walking towards me? Former ballerina Svetlana Lloyd was an in-house mannequin for Christian Dior. She walked for Dior in the 50s. It doesn't. You've still got it. Definitely. <laughs> what was he like, Monsieur Dior? Monsieur Dior had a very high-pitched voice. He appeared always shy. And he also, in a very gentle, subtle way, knew exactly what he wanted. And he didn't need to raise his voice. He didn't need to throw a tantrum. He didn't need anything except to say, in the softest possible way, what he wanted. And it was done. And he had wonderful ideas of how to follow through whatever he wanted so that the execution of it was perfect. He said that what he really wanted in life was to make clothes for decently clothed members of the good society, and that's all. 
he would say, that shoulder needs doing something. And instead of pointing as you and I would, he had a little stick that actually reached. And then he would say, and about there, and about here. As you might with a finger, except that a finger would be a little too near and too intimate. The style of showing is completely different now than was before. We had the so-called French couture style. The idea was to glide. Nowadays, the idea is to walk, decidedly. There was no emphasis on hips at all, so that you did the glide, the couture glide. Today's models adopt a very different style. In the old days, it used to be more like, you know, like, like a woman almost floating through the room. No, that changed a lot. Here we all know it's like quite tough and quite fast. But you definitely don't smile much, do you? No, you don't. That's no. not meant to say no. It's more very serious. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Do, do. So, if I, so now, your lovely smile is inappropriate. Is it on the camera walk? Yeah, you don't do that. You I mean, for, for some, some shows you can, but um, mostly not. So do you mind looking at the camera, smiling, and then going into the so, that, and then... <laughs> <laughs> Dior, the company, learned fast how to be bigger than the man who created it. In 1957, just 10 years after founding the company, Christian Dior suddenly died of a heart attack, aged only 52. Christian Dior's death was totally shocking and unexpected. But there is this genius in place, who is the young Yves Saint Laurent, who is Christian Dior's 21-year-old assistant. And Yves Saint Laurent steps into the master's shoes and is very successful very quickly. And there's no other moment, I would say, in fashion history where you get a great designer, you know, dying, and his successor is already at the house. What he had to say was quite different from Christian Dior. Not romantic, not elegant, but much more feisty, much more 1960s. Yves Saint Laurent gets his chance too at Blenheim Palace in 1958. You don't have to be an expert to see that if there's no startling new line, there's the attraction of variety and, may I say, extravagance in these creations for the evening. Constantinople a smart ensemble more Parisian than Turkish. The last gown presented before the princess was appropriately named Blenin, a magnificent affair in white satin with noticeably long sleeves. Even a stately home can be chilly in winter. Finally, the brilliant young designer was presented to the princess. And he, in turn, presented the 16 mannequins. Back in the same grand library in Chile Blenheim Palace today, in-house designers Serge and Lucy's outfits are revealed to the critical eyes of the fashion world. So Serge and Lucy stand by. Serge and Lucy, go, go. Parfait. It looked quite young and fresh in the sporting elements, so that I thought they did a good job. It's a tough gig, isn't it, being the sort of interim designers? I don't know, because I don't know whether maybe they'll stay forever. Who knows what will happen? In the world of big fashion houses, don't they need the whole need and want a big name designer? I think the main thing is to have a designer who captures the world today. After all, the days when Princess Margaret had her great event here and was sitting in the audience and looking at the clothes, it was such a different world. You know, the society, the sheer strength of the upper classes, all that's gone, faded away. Now they're looking, that mean Dior looking, at international clients all over the world. So we're in a very different position. 
Even before the last crumbs of the magnificent Blenheim tea are eaten, Dior are thinking ahead to what has always been the biggest and most exclusive thing in their fashion year, the Haute Couture Show. It will be the last collection before the announcement of their new designer. Who is the chief designer has always been a key question. Three years of success wasn't enough to keep boy genius Yves Saint Laurent in his job. After he was called up for military service in the Algerian War of Independence in 1960, Dior refused to have him back. He was replaced by the more conservative figure of Mark Bowen. Mark Bowen was kind of extraordinary. He introduces something, I would say, a fluidity to his designs. They're much freer, they're much more fluid. There's certainly no, you know, corsetry in the same way that Dior did. They're not comfortable in the sense that, you know, they're like your onesie or your sort of dressing gown, but I can imagine being able to, you know, run in them and dance in them and, and move in them. Mark Bowen was the designer who brought fantastic clients. I think Princess Grace of Monaco had some of his loveliest dresses. He really knew how to dress what was the thickening waist of Princess Grace, and her style was no longer of the youthful princess. People actually want clothes that flatter them, that make them look good. They want a designer who's sympathetic, not one who necessarily wants to try out all his wild ideas on their bodies. Dior is a big industry, it's a big business, so Mark Bowen was successful. Women wanted to wear his clothes. He made beautiful clothes that made women feel beautiful in them. That's the secret of his success. Avenue Montaigne, in the poshest part of Paris. Number 30, the birthplace of the House of Dior, is still its home today. Hello, let me take my card because we are going to go through the third floor. Okay. Catherine Riviere runs Haute Couture, the most exclusive part of the Dior empire. Here, that's the first floor with the Haute Couture salon. Couture clothes are handmade for the kind of woman who can afford to pay upwards of £20,000 an outfit. You have uh, Princess Diana. Diana, did you meet? Yes, I went to get Clinton, you know, to make some fitting for her. She was charming. Really? I remember she welcomed but she was barefooted. <laughs> very relaxed and uh, it was very nice. That was Princess because, Diana? Yeah, because, you know, we went in her in sitting room, you know, it was like a, a young girl, you know, with ballet shoes hanging. And now the head office, with all its echoes of past glamour, has itself been chosen as the venue for this year's Haute Couture collection. But first, it has to get a makeover. As they inspect the location for their first Haute Couture show, in-house designers Serge and Lucy know that an enormous amount rests on their shoulders. Couture is the house's signature collection, and they've got four days left to perfect their outfits. Three floors up, meet Flo Shehe, the hands of haute couture at the House of Dior. Flo supervises one of the two workrooms, and everything there has to pass through her hands. She has seen designers come and go, and they've all known that they rely on Flo and her fellow workers to produce the goods. Her empire is dresses. Combien Qu'il faut pour faire cette oui. robe, euh, environ 150-160 heures. Oui. On n'en fait pas pour mettre sur des portants. Nous, c'est pas, c'est pas ça. Nous, la haute couture, c'est à la commande. Si elle n'est pas commandée, elle sera jamais refaite. Et vous, vous êtes un bon prédicteur de. Euh, on se, à chaque fois, euh, on dit faux. À chaque fois qu'on dit ça, ça va marcher. À chaque fois, et c'est, c'est ce qu'on croyait pas qui, qui marche beaucoup. Donc, euh, je ne dis plus rien. À chaque fois, on se trompe. Le goût des clients. C'est pas les mêmes que les nôtres, voilà. Puis ah c'est bon? Tout. Bah oui, forcément. <rire> c'est pas grave, mais au moins pour la robe, comme ça on fait la retouche tout de suite. Non, je viens au premier étage avec la fille. Ok? D'accord? Ok. Flo is involved in fittings for the next three days. Every model has to have at least one fitting, and Flo has to inspect and be on hand downstairs for each of her team's creations. 
Flo has a direct, no-nonsense approach to someone she's never met. Non, je vais essayer l'original. J'emmène la fille avec moi. Ah ben, n'y a plus personne. D'accord. Allez, on va là-bas. Et je vais dans l'atelier. D'accord. Haute couture boss Catherine Riviere visits the workshops to inspect progress. This is what we call it's a sample. If there is a client who likes it, can be made in another color if they wish. For example, if you want it in red, in navy, in whatever, it's possible. But then you remake it completely. Ah, it's always. A sample of a haute couture collection and it's never sold. So if a client is a very different shape to the model... They are always a different shape because the models are 16, they are, you know, 34, you know, so... Like they are always different, so it's why we take the measurement. You have all the dummies of the of the client upstairs, yeah, on the on the shelf. These canvases on the top shelves. Clients. Clients. You know, we have a basis, and after we stock them according to the measurement of the client. Uh -huh. So looking at some come over the. You have here. someone big. You have someone thin. You have you know it's you have very you know you know both things. They have to be dressed, you know. No, but it's true. We have ladies, beautiful, but you know who are not a size for thirty-four. You see the different of shapes. You have some with you know very small waist with but you know but this one has no waist. It's a little bit more. You know, how you say, uh, square. You know, every, everybody is different. You have some with hips, with no hips, with, with big busts, with small waist, with big waist, with, you know. They're all different. They like the woman in the world. If you look at, uh, you know, the women, they are all different. Rich and thin. Mm, yeah, of course they are rich, you know. Because it's silly, you know, to say that the haute couture is accessible to everyone. It's not true. It's not accessible to everyone. It's something special. It's a dream. Haute couture has to stay a dream. Avenue Montaigne, Dior HQ. Deep inside the building, hundreds of people are hard at work on the Haute Couture collection, which will be unveiled in three days' time. Flo, the head of couture dressmaking, works on the model fittings. But there's a bit of an issue, a little thing about thongs. Lâche-toi le string, The Dior seamstresses can work with any designer, and they've had to. In 1989, a new creative director was appointed, the glitzy Italian Gianfranco Ferre. It was the first big decision taken by Bernard Arnault when he bought the then ailing company. He obviously took one look at Dior and thought, this is a brand for old ladies. We have to have something younger and fresher. With the appointment of Gianfranco Ferre, he chose somebody who did quite spectacular collections with great big skirts, very Italian, in fact, and I think too Italian for the house. You can look at those clothes and think, well, they're slightly too overblown for my taste, but probably they will have their moment again. I think there are serrés, par contre. Ah, bah, ouais, c'est trop serré. Before Serge and Lucy's couture show, over 50 models are summoned and then pushed and pulled in and out of various outfits as the garments are finalized. 19-year-old Julie Humans from Holland is much in demand. It's now less than 24 hours before the show, but everything seems very last minute. My agency called me around three to say, like, you have to go to Dior because uh, your fitting's at four. So I, like, skipped my plans with my friends and I came here 
and I'm sitting and waiting here, but that's okay, because uh, I just heard them say my outfit will be ready soon. There's an awful lot of waiting around. Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. There always is. But I mean, you have to get used to it. I mean, bring a book, bring your phone. Have you so. bought a book? Yeah, I have, actually. What, what, what are you reading? I am reading... It's a really good book. I'm sure you know it. Reading it in Dutch. It's um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude. So it's really good. It keeps me entertained. Yeah. At last, the proposed outfit for Julie is ready. An embroidered white jacket. Ça va? Mm -hmm. Oui, the head of the tailoring section is Camille Arslan. Lucie voulait plus long and Serge voulait plus court. What's happening there, do you? Um, I don't know. To be honest, no one told me anything, but I'm just changing looks, so either means they want something else or they just want to see something else on me. Julie is now being tried out in a dress. So for the moment, the white jacket will have to be fitted on a different model. Je ne sais pas, c'est où est-ce où ils la trouvent trop c'est les cheveux, c'est ça ça peut être l'allure, ça peut être la façon de marcher, je suis pas dans leur tête, je ne sais pas. It's a mystery. With couture, you have to be uh, shrink, you have to be, you know, it's true. Explain shrink, why psychiatry? Oh, because every woman in the world, even very rich, she has problems in life, you know. When she arrives and she makes a face like that, we know that we have to be very careful and, you know, we have to cheer them up, you know, when they see them, you know, in a nice outfit, you know, and they look great, they are happy. Plus, you know, you create some, you know, nice relationship. We know their life, we know their children, we know where they live. But, you know, we are very, very confidential. There is not one single information which is coming out from the haute couture department. Very important. We have to adapt on the new way of living, on the, on the new client, on the many things. New economy, you know, to know where is the money, where is not anymore, how we can transfer money from this country to the other way. It's an all, you know. Dior has not been afraid of radical change. In 1996, it appointed the most controversial name in the fashion firmament, British designer John Galliano. An enfant terrible takes over at French couture. And I think that what you see with Galliano was this sense of clothes as drama, clothes as spectacle. At his very best, Galliano was a huge success as a designer, and Dior's profits just, you know, spiraled. At his worst, he was very provocative and made people extremely angry. I suppose the one that hit me most was the one of the um, tramps. The idea of taking people who had no homes, who were basically dressing themselves in bits of garbage, it's pretty extraordinary for a house that belonged to couture. But it's certainly, I don't know whether it made the tills ring, but it certainly made everybody think about Christian Dior. But in 2011, John Galliano crashed and burned spectacularly. After a drunken anti-Semitic rant was caught on camera, he was sacked by chief executive Sidney Toledano. A sleek minimalism was brought in by Toledano's next appointment, Belgian Raph Simons. But after just three years, Simons resigned, citing the pressure of work. The demands of designing for Dior are too great for some. Back in Avenue Montaigne, it's the night before the Haute Couture show. Flo and Camille are battling it out to see who has to make the least number of alterations. They can't finish until the designers make decisions. Which model will wear which outfit? No, they hesitate between her and Manon. You think? Because you did your hair? Yesterday we did the hair touch because... 
Moi, je garde ma fille. Hein, reste avec moi. On met. Vous allez battre, battre un peu Oui, on va se battre un peu, là. Ça va être l'euro euh, Dior. <rire> Et, mais Florence, qu'est-ce que vous dites que Vous voulez que cette fille... Moi, je veux que ma fille reste avec moi. The model Flo wants to keep is Sophia from Russia. You're being fought over. Have you understood that? Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> Do you speak French? No, not at all. I want to keep you. I oh, thank you. you. Okay. Yes. Voilà. Regarde quand même la longueur derrière et tu enlèves. Mais tu sais, si, si vous revenez à elle, je la remettrai sur elle. D'accord. Hein, D'accord, parce que j'ai envie de faire des petites choses. Oui. Donc la bataille n'est pas encore. Elle ne s'est pas encore gagnée. <rire> Ça, c'était la première mi-temps. Il va gagner. Oh, c'est pas grave. Elles sont toutes belles, alors je m'en fiche. C'est vrai. Sauf que là, j'ai beaucoup plus de retouches parce qu'elle est beaucoup plus petite. Elle m'a fait une petite... J'aime bien ta fille, hein. Oui, je m'en fiche. Fais comme tu veux, Camille. De toute façon, les bon. hommes, vous, voient un... Ah bah oui Quand je dis, c'est une maison de mec ici. C'est une maison de mec. It's the day of Dior's Haute Couture show. Serge and Lucy's designs are about to be unveiled to some of Dior's richest and most important clients. All the top models are backstage. Bella Hadid, who now has one and a half million more Instagram followers than she did at Blenheim. Julie Humans is now about 50 years through her book 100 Years of Solitude. And Julia Nobis, whom Vogue calls the runway's most wanted model, has just flown in from Australia. I'm tall, I'm skinny, I'm apparently not hideous, like, you know, it's, and people like that, and so cool. Julia started in the business when she was 17 and has just turned 24. I sent in my applications to medical school the other week, so we'll see how that goes, and I guess that'll kind of determine how much longer I have. <laughs> As the newly signed face of Dior makeup, Bella Hadid gets the magic touch of the makeup boss himself, Peter Phillips. <laughs> Up in the workshop, many of the outfits for the show are still not finished. Et demain? Et demain on revient parce que c'est les clientes qui viennent demain. Donc ça commence dès demain matin. Oui. Oui, oui, on n'arrête pas. Mais est-ce que ici, on vous donne le choix d'une d'ici pour vous Ah, je réfléchis même pas. Je ne réfléchis pas à ça. Ce n'est pas le même monde, C'est pas pour moi. Euh, je, moi, je fais des belles choses, c'est pour des princesses, c'est pour des, des dames, voilà. Mais euh, non, ce n'est pas pour... Non, je suis une femme de la terre. In the backstage dressing room, the models are reunited with the unique outfits chosen for them, and in some cases, sewn in. I mean, you know, it's a little revealing, a smidge. Got my single nipple, only one though, not the bow. But you know. I'm happy with just one nipple. I mean, I like a single nipple. Why not? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. This embroidery is insane. The details. I know. The details are crazy. This show is not for the fashion editors. The specially invited guests are people you normally never see. Seriously rich clients who can spend, in some cases, hundreds of thousands a year on Dior Couture. The hallowed staircase they climb is the one where Christian Dior himself showed his collections. Despite predictions of its death, in the select few houses that still do it, Couture is going strong. The customers just come from different places. 
these are the people on whom the future of couture depends and with whom Catherine Riviere deals. The energy is great for the image of the house. It's very important because it's really, you know, the window of the Maison Dior, you know. So if the, the feedback is good, if the reviews are good, it's good for all the product of the house, which is important. Every last speck of dust and stray hair are removed before the models descend the famous staircase. And in just over 10 minutes, the whole show is over. One flight down, it's staff drinks. Chill, chill. Chill, chill. Ça a été? Oui. C'était beau? Oui. Vous le mérite? On le mérite, bah, on va dire oui. <laughs> C'est pas votre monde. Non. Le monde. Moi, moi j'aime le réel. J'aimerais la réalité. Notre joaillerie. Eh bien, et tous mes diamants. Et oui Toute ma richesse For the after show dinner, no expense is spared. Monsieur Toledano and Dior have hired no less than the Palace of Versailles to impress their most important clients. Dior's owner, Bernard Arnault, the sun king of today, is here to meet and greet them. Well, I love haute couture, but I have to find a particular piece. And did you see anything today that you... I saw a lot of treasures, and I have to go and see them in person by appointment. So I will do that. Will you be doing that soon? This week before I leave. Fantastic. Yes. Where do you live and then, I live in Houston, Texas. Dinner is on the stage of the Palace's Opera House. Louis XIV himself performed on this very stage as Apollo, the Sun God, and became known as the Sun King. Dior know how to make these clients feel like royalty. Next morning, it's back to work. The show has been hailed a success, but the press is abuzz with rumors that the new designer has been appointed, just in time for Paris Fashion Week, 10 weeks away. Bonjour. Comment ça va? Je sais pas ce que vous avez dans cette boîte. <laughs> How was it yesterday? Huh? Excellent. The press reception. The press, excellent. And the clients ah. they are coming. They're important. Absolutely, absolutely. They're coming in today? Absolutely. No, very well, very well. And one more question I have to ask. I have a guy waiting for me. But the new designer, is there much talk? Quiet. <laughs> Thank you. Next day, 
Mr. Toledano announces that the new creative director will be the first woman in the role in Dior's history. Next time, Maria Grazia Chiori arrives with only weeks to put together her first show, which attracts the stars.